Hello, my friends. Welcome back and happy Friday to you. You know what that means? Ah, I know you do because you survived the week. So did I. I'm glad. And today I'll bring you good news or good happy eye candy video for the first video to get your Friday going. Or if you're coming from work, you can watch this, have a little laugh, have good emotion and go to a party or a bar, wherever you want to go. This is a Ukrainian female soldier and it's just good vibes. It fills you with good energy. So I think we need it before we go to some other news from Ukraine. This is Kiev and such girls I see in Kiev. Look at the beauty in Kiev. <laughs> she has like a beast of a weapon in the back. She has a full infantry gear, almost full infantry gear, and she's happy, giggly, smiley. Very nice. And I, and I don't think that you can beat such girls. Oh no, definitely not. <laughs> I, I think she can kick my ass. I'd be honored, actually. Yeah, good vibes. But now, my friends, from that good vibes I prepared you, I gave you some good giggly happiness. Now we have to go to the real business. We're going to watch a video together of Miss Yevhenia, who is an 84-year-old Ukrainian elderly woman. And she went back to the destroyed home village in Ukraine, destroyed by the Russians. We're going to watch what she thinks about the war and the whole situation. She was born in 1940 and... This was roughly the time period a little bit after of Stalin's Holodomor in Ukraine. <clears throat> the effects of the hunger had still not passed fully. So you could say she has lived and grown up with the effects and the aftermath of that, of people dying by the millions in Ukraine, by the hands of the Russian invasion. Although Stalin was Georgian, it was still, the Soviet Union was a Russian empire. And now the situation is happening again for her. Let's see what she thinks of it. Miss Yevhenia, 84, returned to her destroyed village in southern Ukraine. Where should I live? I had to come back. I'm doing some repairs. And where to live? Where to live out my life? Fear. Shells are flying. It's scary. They're bombing. Old people run away. They're taken away. Fear. Mirne. Battles with occupiers near this village lasted eight months. When they were bombing, we were hiding here. My legs hurt. I could go downstairs, but I couldn't go upstairs. I said, that's it. I'm going to sit here. And if you're raised up in former Soviet countries or like I was born in 96 I'm not even raised in the Soviet Union but you know this kind of picture right here it might mean nothing to the West perhaps because they don't do this anymore because they don't need to they can go to they would go to the supermarket but in the Soviet Union nobody ever had enough food you always had to make enough to the basement pickles uh, jams all kind of ajika sauce, everything that grows in the garden, you put into a jar and you put it in the basement. This was the survival mechanism of the entire Soviet Union because there was no food like there was in America or in the Western Europe. Up until 91, people did this. And even nowadays, some people, literally people do this because they remember not having food. So this is a very familiar look for me, this basement or cellar right here, these jars, all the same throughout the ex-Soviet countries, everything the same. You do this every year. Most of this food would go bad because you couldn't eat it. You just produce more to feel safe that you have it in the basement if the bombs start falling. Oh God, I said, I'll sit here. If they kill me, well, let it be. No, they don't leave me here. They pull me out. Out of 700 residents, less than 100 are left in the village. There is no one here. I would never have imagined that there would be a war. <laughs> These are the most open-hearted Ukrainian grandmothers ever. They will give you everything they have. What's theirs is yours if you visit. They will always give you candy. They always have food and uh, snacks. They, they will make the best food in the world. I have huge respect for these 
this generation that survived. Well, she was born in 40, but the aftermath of the Holodomor, then Second World War, and now another Russian occupation, atrocities by Russia. So in my eyes, huge respect, and I wish her the most peaceful life that there can be under war circumstances. And if I could, I would help her also right now. Now, my friends, I'll throw you into another topic, and I know the topics are jumpy today, from happy to sad to now another one. Well, let's give her time to breathe. Okay, now we're ready for it, because this one is a little bit funny that's coming up. Putin held a speech yesterday, not just any speech. This is not a speech like the Western leaders. When Putin holds a speech, this is a nationally televised event, not only televised, but his speech was streamed across most ad screens throughout Russian biggest cities. So it's like 1984 when the big brother is speaking and everybody has to watch. If you're not watching, the camera in your TV says, stand up, watch. And it's really like that. We'll go into it. It's really eerie. Honestly, it, it is like 1984. Check this out. I'll read you the report first and then we'll check the videos. It's creepy, creepy stuff. The speech gives the impression that the Russian president is hesitating whether Russia's deterrence against the West countries will still work. This is like the summary of the speech, so you know what he said, although it was really boring and long, I think you should know the summary. And that is why the speech emphasizes the readiness uh, for use of strategic nuclear weapon systems. The recent speeches of the French president have somewhat influenced this speech. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron stating that French does not rule out the possibility of sending French troops into Ukraine. That really startled Putin. He started shaking nervously and made this speech. And threats of serious consequences were repeated separately if the supporters of Ukraine move their troops to Ukraine. <clears throat> Putin felt the need to start threatening immediately. See, he, that was, he really got startled. The Russian president was quite nervous and impatient. Two years of war without results in Ukraine does not allow him to report any positive progress. The elections are coming up. He needs to make the game of the play of elections to his own people, but he doesn't have much to show for it because, yes, Avdivka was taken, but the losses were so enormous that they cannot keep this going. And Avdivka is not a goal. It's not no kind of a goal. It's a small city. It's not Stalingrad. President Putin needed to somehow motivate his army and citizens and do it in a way that would further deter Western politicians. Therefore, stories about new miracle weapons were prominent in the speech, especially from the supersonic missiles that no one can stop. The ep this episode is somewhat reminiscent of the propaganda speeches in the camp of the losers before the end of the Second World War. Yeah, remember Hitler's rants at the end of the Second World War? He was making these very energetic speeches. He was full of methamphetamine. He was a full drug addict by the time. And the speeches went crazier and crazier about how German Wunderwaffes and these fake armies, illusionary armies or shadow, whatever they call it, Hitler's imaginary armies would suddenly burst out from Berlin and destroy everybody with the Wunderwaffe. None of that happened. The Red Army took Berlin and the West was felled the Western armies. But the more to the end of the war, the more he was delusional about his Wunderwaffe. My friends, this is what I see it. No Wunderwaffe will ever win any war. Any war is a war of mass logistics. Sheer mass logistics of the dumbest, most mass producible weapons, mass of soldiers, the morale and strategies. It's not about Wunderbuff. A few of supersonic missiles don't change anything. But the fact that Putin was focusing on it and thought himself that this is so important, well, I can compare him to Hitler in his final days. In particular, the Russian president needs to convince the whole world that they can produce new weapons in large quantities. For many, this two-hour performance, two hours. Now imagine you're sitting in that room for two hours and he, uh, Putin is not, you know, Hitler was a very passionate speaker. He had charisma. Putin doesn't have it. He's a very quiet speaker, a very monotone speaker. He doesn't show any emotion ever. So I'm not saying a leader must always show emotion, but the thing is, it's a pain 
to listen to him speak for two hours because it's just so damn boring. Two hour performance reminded them of the presentations of the Soviet state leaders where those in the hall had difficulty keeping their attention. In terms of economy, the Russian president repeated the style that he has practiced before where he talks about fantastic sums that will be spent for the people of Russia at some point in the future. It's always Wunderwaffe in the future. Money is and economy, economic prosperity in the future. That's the Soviet propaganda that always happened, that we will reach the ideal communism in five years. In the next five, because in, in Soviet Russia, there were economic plans of five years. And there was always like the next five-year period is, is going to be the one. So work harder, it's gonna be the next one. It was pretty much the same. So people know it, people remember it, and they go straight back to where they were in the Soviet times of just Try not to fall asleep in the hall. And to illustrate this, we're gonna watch some footage. And I'm not kidding you, it's not a metaphor of trying not to fall asleep. This is people actually listening to Putin's speech, the reactions in the hall, one of the most important people in Russia, the closest Putin's ally circle, listening to their dictator, Tsar president speaking. Let's see. So grim faces, nobody... Like, oh my god, this dude! <laughs> what are you smoking, my friend? Did you do some crack before you came to the speech? Look at this dude! <laughs> what is he thinking about? What do you think? Shoigu, uh, Medvedev, they look... I, I don't know how to describe this face. I, I'm not even capable of making this face. It's like a face of, I'm done with life. I'm done with Russia, I'm done with Putin. Uh, what is this face? <laughs> this dude here is probably a general or admiral, whatever he is, is falling asleep. For this dude is falling asleep. This dude is falling asleep. This dude is falling asleep. And these are the highest of the high of military command because otherwise they wouldn't be in that room. My friend, your dictator is speaking. You will be shot. Wake up. Look, he's barely up. This dude is falling asleep. This dude looks... Oh my God, look at the eyes. This dude is like questioning stuff. This is looking at the ceiling. This one is seeing the future. He's seeing everything that there is. He's seeing through the time, through your bone, into your soul. Look at these eyes. My God, Putin's speech is so boring. Look at these, all of these faces. I would think this is made by AI and the input is make Russian generals and admirals listen to Putin and make them extremely bored and tired. And that's the outcome of the AI. My God. My friends, I wasn't kidding. This is the honest, actual reaction of Putin's closer inner circle to this speech. It tells you a lot. Also, when I mentioned 1984, then yeah, look at this. This speech was televised across Russia. Then ad advertisement screens, huge building-sized screens, televised the entire speech for the people who were around it. Like it was something very beautiful and like that you would watch it, but it's boring and monotone and it's an old man rambling about his pipe dreams and cloud castles. Look, there's 1984 even right here, the big brother speaking. But the big brother in that movie has charisma and the eyes are working. Putin is just, the dude cannot speak. And now again, I'm not kidding you when I say speech was even aired in cinemas across Russia. And you can see this is one of the movie theaters, multiple cinemas, tens if not hundreds of cinemas across Russia. This is what a few people watching the speech, a few people leaving. Now we see the honest reactions. There is yawning, there is like, there is another cinema already. And now a dude is sleeping, another one is not even looking, and the one in the back is in his phone. So you can see that the people in Russia are so apathetic to everything. They don't even care about Putin's speech anymore. They have been brainwashed and taught by the propaganda not to believe anything, not to, not to pay attention to anything. These people are sheep and zombies. And these are the people that Putin can mobilize very easily to war.
because they've been taught to not question any orders, nothing, not to pay attention to anything. They have no mind. Now, my friends, we'll watch a one-minute clip of this Putin speech where he urges Russian families to have eight children, and I'll open up later why this is important. Thank God that the tradition of a strong multi-generational family with four, five, or even more children is being preserved. I gotta fix you here. It's not being preserved because Russians really are not making any children. The population is decreasing, not because of the war, but also because children are not being made. So I don't know what to put and he's talking about the demographics data is quite the opposite so I'm not really sure what is going on about here let us remember that in Russian families many of our grandmothers and grand grandmothers had family of eight or more children the eyes this girl has given up on life he's given up on everything when this guy is leading you of course you give up <laughs> Let us preserve and revive these wonderful traditions. Having many children and large families should become a norm, a way of life. A way of life for all peoples of Russia. For all peoples of Russia. Putin is the one ethnically cleansing Russia from finno ugric and non-Russian ethnicities, minorities. So all peoples, I guess he means all these different people's groups. But at the back, behind the scenes, he's sending them all the war to die. So again, he's contradictory. And the family is not just the foundation of the state and society. It is a spiritual manifestation, a source of morality. Now again, these words are beautiful. And the meaning is beautiful and right. But if it comes out of Putin's mouth, whose actions are completely the opposite, then it suddenly becomes a comedy. <laughs> Support for a family, motherhood and childhood should encompass the work of all spheres of public administration. Our economic... Okay. And this is important. Now I'm jumping on topic here. But Putin is actually not in the room. He's not live speaking to a bunch of audience who feel his charisma and power. No, he's in his bunker speaking to a microphone and camera and watching live audience reactions from the screen. So why is this important? Because you saw the other generals and admirals who were falling asleep and Medvedev barely hanging on to pay attention. Putin sees it all. The big brother is always watching through a screen. He's watching your reactions in close-up television in his bunker. And he sees and puts you in a list if you fall asleep. This is why they're all fighting not to fall asleep. The hardest thing is to listen to this speech two and a half hours full. I'm not even going on, but this is pure comedy for me. Also, why Putin wants people to have children is because in Russia, children are being started, started to being brainwashed from kindergarten. When they're four, five, six years old, they already start reenactments of Kursk tank battle, Stalingrad battle. They start these small children's outfits from uh, Soviet uh, infantrymen. They have wooden PPSH machine guns. They play around with them. It's brainwash and grooming for war. This is what Putin is doing to Russia's children. The more children he brings up like that, the more meat he will have for future wars or the next dictator have for future wars. He's preparing meat resources in kilograms and tons for the future conquests and atrocities. This is what he's doing. This is why he needs the mass of children to be brainwashed into meat. This is how it is. My friends now will watch a video from Abdivka and this is uh, very important because Many people don't really understand why F-16s would change anything. And here, I will show you, they will. This is Russian Su-25s, two of them. Now in this video, we see six of them flying in pairs of two. So three sorties, choo, 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 go over Abdivka. Now Abdivka is five, four kilometers from the front right now. These are Russian jets, Soviet-made jets, uh, Su-25s, made in 1970s and, and 80s. About 300 of them Russia has. Thing is, F-16 would make quick work of these jets. Su-25 is no match, not even comparable to F-16's capabilities. It would be just shot out of the sky immediately. But now Russia is flying with three sorties and all together six planes over Avdivka on the front lines. Yes, they will lose one or two like they have been losing every day for now, for the last 10 days. But they're still flying because they don't care. F-16 will change that. Now, my friends, usually I know what video I'm watching and what to tell about this video. But this next one, honest to God, I have no idea what I'm watching. I have no idea what it means. I have no idea which language he's speaking, who he is 
or what is he doing in this war. But we're going to watch. I bring you the questionable samurai in Russo-Ukrainian war. Look, he has a antlers, antler on his head, and he has nice mustache of Salvador Dali, and he has a samurai sword. <laughs> My friends, I have nothing to say about this. I don't know what this is. I just, it's so bizarre, I wanted to share it with you. It's in Ukraine. Put it in the comments, please. Open up the context. What the hell is this? <laughs> Well, you got to say much, my friend, for helping Ukraine, but um, the method is questionable. What the hell? Now, my friends, again, like in every video, Anton Hiroshenko is back. I use his material so much that I should put him in like an official producer of this channel. I'll read you uh, an analysis. What does Sweden bring to the table connected to Russia's Kaliningrad, the Suwalki Gap, the politics? and the Baltic Sea. Uh, the analysis is short and summarizing, so I will not waste your time and give you a very short summary. After 20 months of resistance and provocations and concessions, Hungary has agreed to Sweden's accessions to NATO. This is a historic moment as it is the first time in 500 years that as all Scandinavian countries are part of the same defense alliance. Um, what was the last one? Was it Kalmar Union? Please tell me if it's true. Yes. If you're from USA or Western Europe, it might sound funny, but there was an actual military powerhouse involving four to five different Nordic countries that was almost unbeatable, the Kalmar Union. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Sounds like something out of SpongeBob, but it was the great and only Kalmar Union. <laughs> I don't ask. It's history. With Sweden's succession, NATO will again be able to expand its power in Northern Europe. But is the Baltic Sea NATO's inland sea? It's not that simple. In 2022, GPS signals of Finnish airplanes have been jammed several times. Russia is believed to be behind the sabotage. Even though the Soviet Union no longer exists, the agreement on the demilitarization of the island, island is still in force today. And now I read you the most important point, which is true and not true at the same time, and it's complicated, but I'll read it to you. The United States think tank Rand Corporation predicted in 2016 that it would take Russian soldiers a maximum of 60 hours to reach Riga and Tallinn. And boom, this is Tallinn where I am now, and this is Riga, the southern capital of and Latvia and this Lithuania also. Now let's open up this 60 hours. Russians were massing troops on the Ukrainian border for two months and it was all visible on satellite photos. Joe Biden was screaming, CIA was screaming for two entire months, 60 days that this is happening. Nobody did nothing except for Estonia who sent a lot of jambalins and a lot of weapons before the war started even. So when Russia has capabilities, if Russia wants to have capabilities to reach Tallinn in 60 hours, that means they have to have a lot of mass. Because Estonia has foreign troops, over a thousand actually, doesn't mean much for the over a thousand, but we have, F Finland has an air force, Sweden has navy, Estonia has a lot of troops, there's an entire division in the Baltics. If Russia wants these 60 hours, they have to mass a lot of troops, concentrations of troops to Estonian border, to Narva, to follow the narva Tallinn highway, the highway from east to west. Now, amassing these troops, Russian style, we know it takes time for them. For Ukraine, it took 60 days. Let's say it takes even 30. Well, we have satellite photos from the second day of the massment of troops. Right now, what's behind the Estonian border in Russia? Empty. Nothing. All of the army, the Western armies, the units, they're in Ukraine and they're minced up. Some of the units have been deleted because they're all dead. So nothing is next to Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania right now. That means as soon as they are massing troops in the area where there's nothing right now, everybody will know. The CIA will be screaming, Joe Biden or whoever is the United States president will be screaming. There will be be more troops sent to Estonia from the west, more armored vehicles, Finland will get its air force ready, Sweden will deploy its navy to the Finnish Gulf between Estonia and uh, Finland, and this 60 hours is not 60 hours anymore. Suddenly, <laughs> it is supposed to be 60 hours and then it becomes a three-year war, which Russia loses. So it's not that simple, really, especially when Finland and Sweden are now in NATO. And satellites will see everything Russia does, because we see right now there's nothing, Tomorrow we see there's something, we're going to react immediately. Now, my friends, in the previous video, I mentioned that uh, Macron stated that he does not rule out sending NATO troops into Ukraine or sending French troops into Ukraine. And I bashed Macron for it. Now, a lot of people got mad at me and I have to open up a little bit what I meant. I did not bash the idea of sending NATO troops. 
good idea, great idea, do it. I mean, I'm from Estonia. I, I'm not afraid of escalation. There's nothing to escalate for me. I'm going to die if Russians come in. I have balls for that. Yes, yeah, send them in, send the tanks in, blow them to bits, the Russians. What I bashed is Macron's decision not to communicate this before with other NATO countries because the whole strength of the Western countries is unity and also unity in diplomatic communications. This is what you would call a diplomatic plunder because the first rule, you communicate with your partners, you find a similar message and you convey it in a similar way. This is not what Macron did. He just came out with this crazy statement without alerting anybody. That is a diplomatic plunder. That is what I bashed. That is a bad idea. It's a sign of weakness, actually. Unifying West, speaking different messages in a different way, is a sign of weakness and confusion and this bad communication between the countries. And it's placed to the Putin's hands. So this is what I bashed. He should learn diplomatic communication. But now, Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Gallas, who is a woman, but she has more balls than any kind of man would have in a prime minister position. She is the strongest prime minister Estonia has had in 20 years. Really like her. I'm going to read what she did, because as, as the only country right now after Macron, she comes out with this. Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Gallas has supported Emmanuel Macron, saying that Western leaders should not exclude the possibility of sending ground troops to Ukraine. Hey, Kaya, if you're watching this, you got balls. Balls of steel, way to go. Yes, I do support that also. I just wish Macron would have communicated that before to other countries so they could have have had a unified, strong, collective West message to Russia. But hey, Kaya pulls through because she don't, she's not afraid of the Russians. She's not afraid of no tanks. There's even a photo of her with a javelin. She will take that javelin, boom! No more Russian tanks, so we have quite our fight. My friends, check it out. This is 69th Sniffing Brigade and Noel, yes, the military blogger from X or Twitter, Noel, who gives us daily updates about Ukrainian war. He does an amazing job, he's very focused on it. He's doing another fundraiser. So I can vouch for him because I've already been next to his deliveries and I've helped him deliver these drones. He brings in a lot of money, he gives the drones to good units and the drones, the units put them in great work. So I can vouch for this uh, fundraiser. The link is in the description below and they're trying to get to 125k. If the drones will be bought and delivered, I'll be standing next to these drones and thanking you, my friends. Links in the description below. Thank you, Noel, for doing this. My friends, we survived this week. I'm so glad that you came back. Uh, I will see you again on Monday. And until Monday, be back, my friends. Push the bell button and subscribe to be notified. Slava Ukraini and bye-bye.